Ladies and gentlemen, together we advanced PCs. That was the whole premise of AMD's recent event, and they provided a plethora of information for their Ryzen 7000 series processors. We have IPC information, benchmarks, prices, but on top of that, we're going to discuss some comments from AMD after the event, and perhaps these are even more important than the disclosures which AMD released at the event itself. And I want to begin, though, with a very intriguing tease um, which AMD kind of gave us for RDNA 3. Obviously, these are going to be the ultra-high powerful GPUs which will uh, launch later this year. And it seems AMD teased one of the flagship parts, and we're going to get right into it after this message from the video's sponsor. If you're running a copy of Windows 10, which isn't activated, of course, not only do you have to worry about the missing customization options, but there's also that annoying Windows desktop watermark reminding you to activate. Today's video is sponsored by WhoKeys.com, and they have an excellent price on Windows 10 Professional, as well as Home Keys. Yeah, and they also, of course, sell games. I've bought a few Windows 10 keys with my own personal account to test everything was legit and worked in preparation for this sponsored video. You can pick up one of their keys for 25% off using the coupon code RGT in the checkout. There's links to their website in the video description. Also, if you're building a few systems, there's bundles available too. Again, you can check out whokeys.com and use the coupon code RGT for 25% off the listed Windows 10 key prices. So the unnamed RX 7000 series GPU actually was shown in a photo. You can see yourself that it looks pretty cool. I mean, essentially it looks pretty much like a reference design RDNA 2 GPU with a few changes. Unfortunately, we don't get to see the card in its entirety, but it does look pretty nice, at least in my personal opinion. Now, again, we don't know the specifications of the GPU. AMD provided no technical details as to the amount of RAM, the number of shaders, or any of that stuff, but they did show a game running, Lies of P, which actually looks pretty cool, at least in my personal opinion. So the RX 7000 series GPU was running on an AM5 platform with the Ryzen 9 7950X provided the CPU grunt. So basically speaking, AMD confirmed a few things. The first is that it's an MCM design, which is essentially not particularly new information. David Wang, though, did confirm, uh, by the way, David Wang, for those who don't know, is the Senior Vice President of Engineering Radio at the Radeon Technologies Group, basically states that the RX 7000 series will offer over 50% performance per watt uplift, versus RDNA 2, and also provided, again, a little bit more of a technical breakdown as to what we can see. With AMD claiming that Narve 3 graphics will be at the forefront of graphics innovation, industry-leading performance per watt, advanced packaging technologies, system-level efficiencies, and finally, advanced multimedia capabilities. I'm just going to discuss that briefly in this video because, quite honestly, there's a couple of very interesting updates for RDNA 3, as well as RTX 40 that I'd like to get into, and this is probably going to be a video for tomorrow. But the vast bulk of this video, as you probably guessed from the title, is really going to focus on... Um, well, Ryzen 7000. There's actually been a couple of independent benchmarks, even more actually, which have leaked recently. I'm going to go into those briefly in just a moment. But I do want to just run over my thoughts, actually, for the Ryzen 7000 series. So, top-of-the-line CPU, and you can see the prices on screen yourself. I'm not going to run through all of them, just a few that kind of raised my eyebrow. So, the 7950X is going to be $700. US I actually don't think that's terrible. Um, and the 7700X is 8 cores. 16 threads, of course, at 400 US dollars. Now, I do think that that is a little more expensive. It's really quite difficult to ascertain at the moment how competitive this is versus the 13th generation because obviously Intel haven't released their prices, they haven't released all of the specifications of their CPUs. There have been a lot of leaks, but ultimately, a leak is not the same thing as official confirmation. I do feel that. With the higher platform costs, uh, especially with DDR5 memory, the lower end Intel SKUs could definitely be very competitive with budget builders. At the end of the day, there's a very interesting uh, slide that AMD have provided us. We're going to get into the specifics in the IPC in just a moment, but while this is going through my head, I do want to just mention that according to AMD, the Ryzen 5 7600X is a 
well, you can see yourself on screen depending on the application. 5% average, uh, sorry, 5% faster in gaming on average, with some games being significantly faster, for example, F1, while others are basically a tie or a little bit slower. Now, again, that's with a 12900K. However, but honestly speaking, the 12900K isn't that much faster than a 12600K from Intel. Roughly speaking, they're about the same speed. Obviously, there are clock speed differences, and the additional cores are certainly going to help non-gaming applications. But uh, basically speaking, I would say that there's not that much in it between a 12600 and 12900K. So it's going to be very interesting when, when we see the 13th generation parts from um, Intel and exactly what they've managed to achieve. As for AMD's own claims, they basically stated that it's 5.7 gigahertz maximum frequency, so that's 800 megahertz faster than the Ryzen 5000, so obviously that's pretty impressive, and a 13% IPC uplift, so total, this is 29%. That is actually higher than AMD had initially claimed, of course, so they were kind of sandbagging, and if we compare other CPUs, for example, the 7950X, and we compare that versus the 5950X, well, yeah, at 1080p, obviously at the end of the day, some titles are going to be significantly faster, while others not so much. What the, perhaps the most impressive thing, though, with the Zen 4 architecture is obviously content creation, you know, and especially any applications which heavily utilize AVX 512. It's kind of ironic that uh, AMD have AVX 512 working quite well on Zen 4, and of course we all know the story of what happened with Intel and Alder Lake and how essentially they've pretty much just abandoned AVX 512 on Alder Lake. As you can imagine, there is absolutely no uh, word whatsoever on the vcache processors we do know of course they're incoming i personally think they're going to be early next year but that's not any official word of course from amd so we could be waiting a long time for the vcache processors but i don't think amd are going to launch them you know q4 2023 i think personally it's going to be like q1 q2 we see the vcaches and it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with the pricing and also how uh, intel themselves respond i've heard that the vcache processors are significantly faster than the vanilla processors which isn't super surprising of course but at the end of the day the benchmarks amd have provided us officially i don't think are conclusive enough at the moment for anyone to make a decision uh, whether to upgrade or not now i'm not saying for you guys not to i'm not saying that the processors suck at the end of the day my 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 you know my my purpose uh, to you know run this channel is one of the main ones and you know one of them is just i bloody enjoy talking about technology and being a geek but you know one of the reasons i create this stuff is to kind of keep you guys informed and my personal opinion is that i would wait for uh intel at the minimum to show off their stuff before you put your money down and make a decision. Wait for reviewers to kind of get hold of Rise and see what any teething problems, you know, exist. But again, obviously, at the end of the day, that's your money. I suspect for many who have like a 5800X3D or even a 5950 or a 12600 or whatever, they may just want to skip this generation of processors or maybe wait until like the V caches come out or something like that. But again, I'm spitballing and I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I just want to mention, since we're discussing benchmarks, um, a very intriguing Geekbench result um, for the 7600. Uh, this is courtesy of HXL, also known as 9550 Pro on Twitter. And yeah, you can see yourself that they are directly comparing the 7600 versus a 12900. Essentially speaking, the two processors are basically neck and neck in both integer as well as floating point results. Uh, obviously, the 12900KS here has a whole 100 megahertz difference. Clearly, if this was back in, like, you know, the early 90s, that would be pretty meaningful. But, uh, you know, nowadays, it's like, who gives a crap about 100 megahertz? But basically speaking, the two processors are roughly on par with one another. It's going to be very interesting, of course, just to see how, A, these processors deal with, like, different coolers and overclocking, undervolting, all of that. But also things like different memory configurations, how sensitive they are to, let's say, uh, latencies and clock frequency and all of that. So... There's definitely a lot of interesting 
uh, questions we still have because we don't even know at the moment how good the biases are uh, which are being used to kind of leak all of this stuff. We know that they were, well, let's use the word not ideal. And I want to finish this video with perhaps the most interesting thing um, of the whole video, at least in my personal opinion, because there are a couple of very interesting statements from AMD themselves. Uh, this has been compiled by WCCF Tech, so I'm going to leave a link to their article in the video description. But long story short, what AMD have stated is that they are committing to the AM5 platform to a minimum of 2025, and have also confirmed that AM4 as well as AM5 will be coexisting for some time. Now, 2025 essentially is confirming that Zen 5 will be on AM5. I don't think anyone really expected AMD to release a different platform at any point. Um, you know, before Zen 5 released, I mean, that just wouldn't really be likely. I suppose technically they could have done so, but let's be honest, did anyone really think that was going to be a thing? And naturally, the AM, um, sorry, the uh, Zen 4 um, v cache processors, of course, will also be on it as well. Another really intriguing thing, of course, is that with older generation Ryzen processors, for example, you know, the 3950X, there was no iGPU. And of course, this did change with Zen 4. Now, at the end of the day, this iGPU is not exactly going to set the world alight. It is not going to be running Doom Eternal at 4K, of course. But it does have a couple of important reasons for existing. The first of which is just if you want to do office work, basically it's there. The second, according to AMD, as more specifically Robert Halleck, it's for diagnostic purposes. For example, if you're the owner of a graphics card and it breaks, or maybe you're just trying to do, you know, the shuffle where, you know, a new generation of cards coming out, you want to upgrade and you don't want to just have to buy like a cheap, um, discrete card in the meanwhile so it can be quite useful for that for RMAs that type of thing but the other big one and this is the one that I find much more intriguing is that AMD states that they want to do G APUs with big graphics so it's APU with big graphics and CPU with little graphics now this is something I've mentioned a few times that I do uh, I have been thinking AMD are going to be really pushing, particularly given, you know, Infinity Cache and a lot of the other technologies that AMD have been pushing. Um, at the end of the day, there is a lot of capability for AMD to just do some really advanced stuff. And really, I guess the best way of describing it would be doing, doing Smart Shift, but just like the next level of Smart Shift, being able to easily swap workloads between CPU and GPU, sorry, CPU uh, cores between, you know, let's say Zen 5 onwards, where you have the, you know, high performance cores, the low performance cores, you have the, you know, the little graphics, and that would be running on the desktop, and then obviously the ultra high powerful GPU on the APU would be working its workload. There's a lot of capabilities, and Frank Azor also mentions that we are developing a lot of technologies that make use of integrated graphics in many ways. A lot of technologies such as Smart Shift Eco, where we can turn off discrete graphics and run off the notebook or the iGPU because it uses less heat, longer battery life, even if you're just playing a game. So there's a lot of benefits to it. Because we have thin integrated graphics in Ryzen 7000, it's also going to allow us to bring these technologies to desktop. And I think, ultimately speaking, AMD do have a lot of... Um, you know, wiggle room here because obviously they they are essentially the the pioneers of the platform. If you're obviously creating a platform where you can have control of both the CPU, the uh, and as well as graphics, but also the motherboard and actually the software around it, you can do some really interesting stuff. I'm going to be very interested to see how Intel respond, of course but also NVIDIA. With that said, that's just a quick catch up. Well, I say quick, I guess it was quick for me. Catch up video on all of the stuff from AMD. There will be a more in-depth video over the next couple of days, which is gonna focus more on uh, RTX 40, RDNA 3, and some other bits and pieces. But hopefully you have enjoyed this one, and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.